I was amazed to learn that you were 23 with that when you got that role, that's yeah. incredible. And obviously as a kid watching, you seemed like, you know, so grown and adult with it. Like you did not seem like you were a 23 year old and just like, oh, young hotshot lawyer, LA, got it, you know, get the whole gist of it. For you, what was the significance um, as a black man to get that kind of role on that show that was very iconic? Oh man, well, you know, you gotta understand it was, uh, and, and you know this, it was the number one dramatic show on television. We were on Thursday nights at 10 o'clock. The biggest show on television, almost in the history of television, was The Cosby Show. That came on at 8 o'clock on Thursday nights. So that whole run, Cosby Show, I forgot what came I think it was uh, Michael J. Fox's show, um, uh, Family Matters. Uh, not Family Matters, but anyway, it was just a, it was a must-see TV, they called it at the time. So I came on at the beginning of their second season, so I knew what I was walking into. I knew this was like a hit show. And I was just trying to find my own my own way in that. But I knew if I got this right, and if I didn't mess this up, if they didn't fire me, um, I knew it would be a game changer in my um, in my career and and, and and subsequently my life. And it was. So um, but, was that an audition situation? Or oh yeah, did, oh yeah. No, that okay. that was definitely an audition. And they they were getting some heat. Ironically, you mentioned Mario Van Peoples. He did the pilot, I believe, in the very first four episodes of L.A. Law, the first season. Then that character went away. They had no black characters for the rest of that season. So they were getting some heat and people were writing letters saying, no, we're black folks. You know, we're there no black attorneys. So I I, I appreciate that. I always under, I always appreciate the the system of the, 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 the uh, sense of activism um, and agitating and making noise because that's how you promote change. And I know I would have been on LA Law had not people in our community said, we want to see somebody who looks like us on that screen. So I kind of knew that was why they were looking for a black actor, but um, I just wanted to make the most of it because at that point you asked about the eighties and this was, was, was 86, 87, around that time, you know, um, it was very rare to see a young, articulate, um, aggressive black man on television at that time. So uh, I was, you know, I was and I am very honored to have been able to play that role. Yeah, I, uh, and the sitcom I believe you're thinking about was was uh, Family Ties. Family Ties. <laughs> family ties. Yes, it was family. Right. So were you at the time, um, because you're young and you're still trying to establish yourself in the industry, were you aware of the weight of that, that you were representing something bigger than just Jonathan Robbins? You know, I didn't I didn't really recognize, I didn't recognize it at the time. It was years later, as I said, I was on the show seven years and in 94, Nelson Mandela was uh, released from prison in South Africa and Winnie Mandela had come to the United States and we we're at a party and, and a group of us artists in, in, in Hollywood, uh, Alfie Water, Mary Steen Burgeon, Danny Glover, um, uh, Robert Guillaume and myself and others started an organization called Artists for New South Africa. Literally, my friend Alfie Water said to me, all we got to do is when somebody puts a microphone in your face, you know, promote your project, but also talk about Nelson Mandela, talk about apartheid, keep a focus on that. That was the the impetus of that project. So we were very much involved in South Africa at that time. So when Mandela comes to the United States, there's a party, a backyard party, and I meet her for the first time. And when she saw me, she, her face just lit up. And she said, every child in my country wants to be you. Now, I was very clear, it wasn't me. But it was the first time that I really understood the, 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 the breadth and the width and the depth of of these images that we create and how they can just travel the world, travel the globe and how they can affect people. Another shot, you know, another just quick aside was, um, you know, we had one episode in LA Law where my character, Jonathan Rollins, was going to leave the firm because that firm would not divest in South Africa. And he made a stand. And, you know, I'm an actor. I just go to work, learn my lines, go to work, do my thing. You know, what's the next, what's the next episode? Okay, learn those lines, keep going. And when I went to South Africa, it was around 90, 94, I met a man named Jeffrey Redebe, who was in prison with Nelson Mandela on Robben Island. And he said, you know, we had TVs in Robben Island and we would watch LA Law. It was the number one show in, the, in South Africa. In fact, that trip when I went to South Africa, I had a bodyguard, big, big white guy. His name was Paul. Very cool. But he said, you know, you were one of the most hated people in this country because I had an interracial relationship on LA Law at that point. He said, people want to kill you. They, they want to shut down the, the station that aired L.A. Law in South Africa at that time because of that interracial relationship. But anyway, so Jeffrey Rodebe said, you know, when we saw that episode, we knew that the world was watching. It reminded us, they knew, it reminded us that the world was watching and paying attention. So so it's a long answer to your question, but it, it's moments like that earlier on in my career when it just really 
resonated with me that is so much bigger. The images we play, the, the, the roles we choose, uh, is so much bigger than just what we may want individually as an actor. So, um, and see, I wasn't gonna tell you this because I didn't wanna sound corny, but uh, to reiterate what Winnie Mandela said, um, other than journalism, the only career I ever thought about was being a lawyer. And that was because I saw you on LA Law. And I was like, oh wow. shit, black people can be lawyers? <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, I know what y'all did because you were a corporate attorney. I was like, I don't know what that is, but my man got a nice ass car. He's always dressed <laughs> to the nines, like all that. And I was like, yeah, I want that. <laughs> yeah, he's fly, he's doing his thing. He's doing his he's thing. He's doing his thing, no, right? I but I think for a lot of black people to see us represented like that in a professional space, it was just like a world that, like, oh yeah, we we do belong here. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm glad that you were able to realize the significance of that. Now, beyond just the cultural significance of what it meant to see someone like you on LA Law, the personal impact to your specific career. How did that change the trajectory of your career? Who well, you know, it, it elevates you in a sense where people want to hire you, which is good. Um and then to me, it was just about, okay, how do you be selective about what you play? Because my, what I always wanted to do was have, I, I hoped and prayed for was to have longevity in this business. And you're right. I was young. I was out of, right out of college. I was 21, 20, no, 23 when LA Law happened. Um, so I was young and I, I knew I'd heard about so many people who are on successful shows at that time, especially in the seventies and eighties, where you'd never hear from them again. They'd be, they become famous on one show and then you'd never hear from them again. You, they would not have other opportunities to work that that game has changed now. Not only can you be on a hit show and continue to have a long career, but also it used to be in the 60s, 70s, 80s, if you're on a TV show, they wouldn't even allow you anywhere near a movie camera. They wouldn't allow you in, in, in on the big screen. That changed completely. So it's a whole different world now. Um, so, so I'm grateful for that. And, and all of that personally was, was started in my career because of the success of that show. But then it becomes about, okay, now how do you manage that? How do you navigate a career? How do you get longevity in this industry? And part of that navigation, because um, I've listened to you talk about this before, for you seemed to be that you wanted to be very intentional about the roles that you play. Because I, I don't know, like after LA Law, where, you, where people throw parts of you playing a lawyer at you like left and right, or, <laughs> or was this... Yeah, or was it still, as you mentioned earlier, like in the 80s, you know, the 90s? I mean, it kind of went a long way where like typically a lot of Black men were cast as more gangster type of roles. So, you know, did that open up broader thinking about the type of actor that you wanted to be? Come on, Jamel, with the word. My favorite word is intentional. Mm -hmm. You know, my favorite action is intentional. Because things don't just happen. You know, it always amazes me. You hear people talk about success, especially in show business. Well, I never thought this was going to happen. Well, you probably thought at some point it was going to happen because you went for it. And then even if you get like one break to have a career, you kind of have to build that. And, and what one usually has to do is be intentional about how you build that. You know, for me, you know, when I was a kid, the actor I watched more than anything that, that inspired me was Sidney Poitier. So what he represented in terms of dignity and in terms of strength and in terms of in, in, internal fortitude, all of that grace, all of that is what, and my dad was very much and, and, and embodied all, and still does, he's 91 years old, embodies all of those characteristics. And that was the kind of actor that I, I aspired to be. Um, so I was intentional about playing those kind of roles where, where you know, they can be upstanding and, and uh, as people call it, the noble Negroes, but uh, but that but you know that was really the first ten years of my career, and then Posse was the first time I got to play a bad guy, you know, playing Carver the sheriff, uh, who was who was an asshole, and and I kind of liked that. I said, oh, I like this guy, the kind of thing. And then the other roles came, where you know the biggest one that was a game changer in my career was Just Cause, where I played a serial killing pedophile, Sean Connery, Lauren Fishburne. One of the greatest Lauren plot twists in in any mer like mystery thriller movie I've ever seen. Oh was, man, was thank you. Yeah, that's an yeah. incredible plot twist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh man, but you know that that really changed the whole trajectory of my career because prior to that, I played a lot of you know oversimplified good guys. You know, what you see is what you get. He looks like a good guy, you know. But really, it was Carver initially, Posse, and then Just Cause that allowed me to play, which had become somewhat of a pattern. Someone you think is one thing, but there's always much more behind his actions and his eyes. So just because you somebody looks a certain way, you can't trust that you think he's going to be warm and fuzzy and nice guy. Um, 
and that that those kind of characteristics have been a lot of fun to play throughout the years. But to me, it's really about mixing it up. You know, my my daughter's twenty three now. She says, you know, all my generation thinks all you play are bad guys. <laughs> so uh, that's cute because they don't know the whole body of work. But uh, but I but I enjoy it. He was like, why are you always playing bad guys? I said because I love it because it's <laughs> because it has and mystery. Didn't... And you didn't bring up Carlos Armstrong. <laughs> oh, that's right. We ain't even got to that. That's right. Carlos oh, my Armstrong. God. You didn't even get to that one. That was the one that I was like, I choked the life out of this motherfucker. If I see him like this, like, that was the one. Got hot grits thrown on you and everything. Hot you deserved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I deserved it. I definitely deserved it.